Thank you for joining us on our journey here to preserve the history of mixed martial arts. When I wanted to take on this project, I needed help. I brought in one of my favorite matchmakers, Miguel Iterate, and the MMA detective, Mike Davis. So to do this, we've been able to preserve history. Welcome and enjoy. Hey, Miguel Iterate back here for the Lights Out podcast. MMA detective joining me, Chris Lytle, off in bare knuckle land, but we are on another one of our deep dives and we have a uh, 50 Fight Club member. Uh, once the Bodog Fight Champion, UFC veteran Trevor Prangley has joined us, and uh, I'm not ashamed to say it, a good buddy of mine. Yeah, how you guys doing, man? How you doing, Trevor? Great to be here. So, Trevor, you're obviously from South Africa. Yeah. And you immigrated here to the United States. Could you kind of just, because it's, there's a lot of good information and bad information, it all kind of gets clouded. What was it like growing up in South Africa? It was pretty good, man. I it's uh, I mean, I think that uh, the violence and stuff was blown out of proportion then. It's a lot worse now than it was back then. So I mean, we had we had a great childhood, great upbringing. It, it was it was good. And I mean, can you describe some of the violence that that, that you're talking about? Now, I mean, there's uh, carjackings, house burglaries, murder, uh, rape is a, an epidemic over there. It's it's a pretty badass country right now. You know what I mean? You definitely want to know where you're going and what you're doing when you go over there. It's not like it was. So, so do they not lock people up, like in prison, that commit these crimes? You know, I, I'm sure they do, but the whether they catch them or not and the, the repercussions are way less you know what i mean when you start taking consequences away people are more likely to commit crime you know Trev, Trev, yeah. let's talk about something fun from south africa why don't you tell us a childhood story about lions or something <laughs> <laughs> no lions where i came from buddy but uh lots of snakes uh some baboons and shit like that you know what we used to do for fun sometimes is uh go out around the coast and uh, watch the uh, tourist cars get ransacked by the baboons. It was pretty <laughs> awesome, you know? <laughs> so baboons are funny creatures. They'll send one little baboon out there and the, the where the cars are pull over and people get real comfortable with him. They'd leave their cars open. They'd get out, give him something, and he'd make a squeak, and that pack would just attack that car and just they would rip everything out of it, steal everything, and be gone, you know? So, yeah. But no awesome. lions, but we had to we had to settle for the baboons. <laughs> so you're a high end wrestler from South Africa. You were actually the alternate the Olympic team, and I think you blew your Achilles out, which is why you didn't make the team. No, no, no. I lost in uh, overtime on points, and uh, um, that's why I came to the states. Where I got injured was uh, nationals at college nationals. In the finals, I blew my ACL out. Okay, so, so that was in college. What made yeah, you come was, here? Why wouldn't you continue pursuing the Olympics in your own country? Well, it's, you know, I, I just, it, it's funny how things work out. I met a, a coach from Washington State, from Spokane, actually, which is only about 35 miles from Coeur d'Alene, and he brought a cultural exchange team over there, and they wrestled at one of our tournaments, and that's how I got hooked up with him. But uh, well, I, the province or the, the state I came from, the wrestling wasn't big there like it was up north, so it was really hard to get good training and so forth. So I, we made a decision that I'd come over here for two years, wrestle at college, and uh, head back there and see if we couldn't make that next Olympics. Okay, so you just went to up your level. What is the difference in wrestling between here and South Africa? Well, ma mainly the main difference was uh, freestyle versus collegiate. You know what I mean? But the level of training and so forth over here is just uh, so much higher than it was when I was a kid. I know the wrestling and so forth has got better over there since the sanctions were dropped and, and the country was open. But you got to understand, when I grew up, South Africa was in 27 years of sanctions because of apartheid, you know, and I was on the end of it. We weren't allowed to compete internationally. We had very little uh, international influence on our sports and so forth, you know? So... It was tough. It was tough, especially in a sport like wrestling that evolved so much from uh, when we were competing in the 60s to the late 80s and 90s before I left. I mean, it was a totally different sport by then. Wow. Wow. So w when you came over, you initially started with the lion's step. Am I correct? 
Um, you know, actually, I let me think back now. I started with a small gym in my town. Then, uh, well, where'd you go when when you land? Where, where'd you go to college? Where'd you land in the states? Oh, I, I went to college in uh, North Idaho at, at North Idaho College. It was a really good JUCO. You know what I mean? Coming from South Africa, being 24, I had to go to JUCO first. And uh, it was, uh, we had like 11 national titles. I think they were on number 10 when I got there. And we did win one when I was on the team. So really, really strong wrestling college. I went to Missouri Valley after that just for a semester. But uh, just not, uh, it just didn't last. I was already kind of hooked by the fighting and just wanted to get back onto that. So. Okay. How do you hook in with the Lions, Dad? Well, I, I started working down in Texas for a guy. I helped a guy from Idaho move his business down to Texas, worked there, and uh, started training. I was training up here when I moved down there for a year and a half. I started training with Guy Mesger, and uh, that's how I got hooked into the Lions then, you know, so. Did, did you get jumped in? Did I what? Get jumped in? No, I I, uh, I just started training with him and did a couple of fights, and that was it. And then I helped uh, with Ken's camp when he fought Tito, that first big deal in the UFC, you know what I mean, where they had that first big rivalry fight going on and uh, helped helped with that camp, and, and that's pretty much how I got into it. So let me ask you, is, uh, just jumped in is what Mike was asking you about. Did you do the Lions Den initiation, the the squats and all that stuff? Is because that's nah. kind of okay. no, no, I didn't do any of that. Okay, I think I think I was already past that level to be honest with you. So okay. they 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 just let me in. You know what I mean? I didn't even know they did that to be honest with you. Okay, it might have been prior to my time. You know what I mean? Yeah. Were been... you there when Jerry Bolander was there? Nope, nope. You know, I didn't actually train at the fish. I know they had like a, a official team that they trained with and so forth. But like I said, I was in uh, the the Dallas Fort Worth area. I just trained with Guy, and that's how I got hooked up with them. And then when I left Dallas, I came back up to Idaho and opened my own little Lions Den gym. And uh, then uh, to get extra training, a, a really good friend of mine that I went to college with was Josh Thompson. He had started down AKA, so. Uh, that's how I got down there and hooked up with those guys. You know what I mean? So. Okay. So Evan Tanner, did you work out with Evan? Nope. Nope. Wow. Just Guy Guy Mesger, a little bit of Trey, Trey Teligman. Uh, Alex Travis Andrade. Alex, yep. Andrade. Alex Andrade, yep. But Travis Luter, and then obviously Ken. Okay. So Josh Thompson, you brought his name up. One of the controversies on his record – is when he fought Justin Curtis at the Ultimate Combat Championship. It was like at a high school gymnasium on wrestling mats. Yeah. You were his corner. Yeah, I was, yeah, I was there. What do you remember about that event? He won that fight. I fought on that event, too. We just, we, we jumped in. A, that was old school MMA, buddy. We jumped in a, in a little car. We drove down to Montana. They gave us 20 bucks for gas money. We took our tents and camped on the river and went and fought in a high school on a wrestling mat. Yeah. So uh, it was a good fight, you know, but Josh definitely won that match, but it, he was hometown, hometown favorite there. I don't even know who the judges were or anything then, to be honest with you, we just went and fought, you know, it was really disorganized back in the nineties, the fight game. There was <laughs> the Montana. Rule. Montana, Plains, Montana. I mean, the town's like, gosh, 1500 people, maybe 2000 people. Yeah. Just a little small town at a high school. Well, what I like is whatever Josh, we interviewed Josh Thompson, we talked about this. And he's like, the guy I fought, his mom and dad were collecting tickets. His aunt and uncles were the judges. His, Probably. You know, his brother was a video guy. So he says all this. He was hometown. Justin Curtis comes into our, our, our YouTube comments saying, that's not true. What he's saying isn't true. He's real quick to answer everybody's questions. And then I asked, well, what were the names of the people that were working this? And then he never comes back again. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he was a strange character anyway. You know what I mean? I mean, he, he was reasonably tough for the day, but he didn't beat Josh on that night. It was a good fight, but he didn't beat him. All right, so you, not, you've, not got, 
I'm not just saying that because Josh is one of my best friends. You know what I mean? I'm just saying that wasn't a legit win. Well, you can watch it. I mean, it's it's as plain as day who won. I mean, it's on it's on. Oh, it's out there. I didn't even yes. know the video is out there. Yeah, it's out there. It's yeah. it's plain as day what what happened there. So at least yeah. his brother, the video guy, did his job, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right. He kept he kept everybody honest in a dishonest world, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, your amateur career, there's quite a a bit of mystery around it because it's undocumented. But we've had people in the past on this podcast that have claimed to have fought you as amateurs. One of which yep. is Dennis Kang. Yep, yep. I fought Dennis Kang my third fight. My third fight ever. They they brought me up to Canada. We went up to British Columbia, asked me if I wanted to fight. They said, yeah, they got a green guy up there. You know what I mean? I'd only had two fights before that. And I went up there and I was on the poster as the main event. And I was like, huh, that's pretty suspicious. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, yeah. So anyway, got in there with Kane, got fucking knocked around a little bit. You know what I mean? His, my striking was nowhere near his was at that day, but just, uh, Managed to uh, weather the storm and then and, and pull off the submission victory. Yeah. Do you remember like getting, the promoters? I was getting my ass kicked. To, I was getting my ass kicked pretty good in that fight. I'm not gonna lie, but you know. Yeah. Right on that time was I beat, kind I of like beat many guys with my iron chin and my my massive cranium. So that's I think how I beat Dennis that night. So. Yeah. <laughs> so the promoters of that event were kind of notorious in the biker world i think i think both of them went to jail actually shortly after this do you remember being like pretty kind of seedy well not really like i said the only thing that was seedy was like i was supposed to be fighting a a really green guy and uh, i was the main event and you know yeah (laughs) yeah on the poster as the main event everything we got up there i mean we they gave us everything we uh were promised so it wasn't like we got our hotels and our, our little bit of pay and all that shit so it wasn't like we got treated bad so i don't know about the seediness i mean you'd know more than me on that one yeah, but cool. it wouldn't surprise me you know <laughs> actually you know what in the 90s every freaking mma show was seedy yeah so yeah i don't know i don't know if it, we got to discuss the level of seediness i guess <laughs> i think that's what it was better i thought it was better though oh, way better way better way better yeah. <laughs> I watched, um, I watched that movie, Here Comes the Boom, with my kids about a year ago, and I was like, that's exactly how it was back in the day. You know what I mean? It was awesome. Full of people from the audience. Yeah. 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 So yeah. right before you fought Curtis Stout, and please keep in mind, I'd like to go in order here, but before you fought sure. Curtis Stout on your walk-in, they announced in 1998 you won a WPKO title. I couldn't find anything on that. Yeah, I remember the organization. Honestly, I don't even know what it was. Okay. I mean, I, I, I mean, there, every every little thing had a. It was the World Pancreation and Kickboxing so organization, some shit like that. I don't remember who ran it. I don't even remember who I fought, but I remember the organization. And I had a bunch of little like uh, titles back then for amateur. I mean, I had I have sixteen fights that aren't on my show dog thing from amateur days, and. Uh, I mean, I have one with Chael on there. I have Dennis yeah. Chang on there. I have Robert Farless on there. I have a bunch of guys that just never made it onto the onto the uh, the show dog. I mean, back then, I don't think there even was a show dog, to be honest with you. So when you fought Chael Sonnen, that was actually in 1999. Correct. He got the takedown. You're on your back. And he's throwing lots. Of punches, and he's almost yelling. He actually said almost he's yelling at the re- referee. He's tapping, he's tapping, he's tapping, trying to get like an yeah. easy out. Yeah. Yeah. And then when I took him down, he crept out of the cage and wouldn't go back down to position. If you I don't know if you remember that out of the yeah. ring. Yeah. So we almost didn't fight. I almost said, you know what, fuck off. I'm not gonna fight you again. But then I got so mad that he was being shady that I jumped back in it and uh I mean, I love Chael. We get along really well now, but boy, that sucker to fight him is a circus. So, <laughs> so the rounds were 13, it was one 13 minute round. Correct. That one was one 10 minute round and then a five minute overtime. 
was how that one worked. When I fought Robert Fallis, a little bit after that, it was a 20-minute round with a five-minute overtime. And that was sheer misery. Do you think they were keying on you? Because you literally fought all of Team Quest, at, like, at this point. I think, I, you know, I don't know. I, I just think that they were a, a good team back then. And, uh, you know what I mean? I think they just wanted Gook. I don't know. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. I don't know. You know. How does the Sonnen fight come together? Uh, they just called me and said they have a wrestler who's had a few fights. Do you want to fight him? And that was still really early in my career. Maybe fourth or fifth fight. Maybe second. I, I don't remember. Do you I remember the promoter? Fought. The promoter, I think, was uh, was Linland and uh, Henderson, I believe, with the promoters there. It was at the Rose Bowl. I know. And So the judges were Randy Couture, Dan Henderson, and Matt Linland were the judges for that <laughs> fight. So, yeah, it was probably a team quest show, I'm assuming. You know what I mean? Well, I, I think one of the things, you know, that Trevor was referring to, why they call it maybe, you know, this. I mean, the bottom line is, is against those guys, you do kind of, you can't just put them in against anybody or anyone average. You know, Trevor fit the bill and stuff like that. But a lot of guys don't rise above that. You know what I mean? And Trevor did. So I know Mike is going to take us there. But I think that's why he kept getting dragged into these fights. You could put him on a poster. And the guy would put up a credible fight against your best guy and, you know, eventually started beating. That's what happened. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, so I, I think you're right about that. You know, it took so. But, uh, you know, we just it was funny back then. The, the sport wasn't about the money, man. We just like I just like to compete. You know, I had blown my knee out in the nationals at wrestling and felt like I didn't accomplish what I wanted to accomplish. It was in the finals match. I was up on points when it happened. And I had to withdraw. So I would have been a national champion. I know I would have beat the guy. And uh, so I just like to compete. And really, if they offered me a fight, I took it. I don't think I've ever turned a fight. Well, maybe, I don't know, maybe once or twice. But I doubt I've ever turned a match down in my early career. I just went and fought anybody, you know. Uh, when you reach that 50 fight club barrier, when you cross that line, which obviously you have, the word no doesn't come out of anybody's mouth that often. No. No, I just, I mean, I enjoyed it. You know, it was just, I still enjoy it. Sometimes I get in there and spa with the guys. Not very often anymore, but I do. And it's just a blast, you know what I mean? But the problem is it takes a week to recover. So I don't do it that much anymore. Right, right. Uh, Trev, was uh, anybody managing you at this point? Did you have a manager or were you trying to do that all on your own? No, I mean, I had a, a coach. A coach was the guy who owned the, the jiu-jitsu gym I was training out of and, uh, I mean, he, we just, people just called around and, hey, you want to fight? Do, uh, uh, you know, I don't even think it was, I mean, we were a really small town, man. We was up in Coeur d'Alene, Idaho, really isolated. And I'm surprised we got the fights we did, you know? Mm -hmm. So I think people just called up there and, uh, and, and seeing if we had anybody that uh, wanted to fight, you know? Well, you, you won by triangle against Chelsonen. Correct. Which, uh, I'm sure it didn't sit well. Was there trash talk prior to this or was he not? The Chael Sonnen who we see today at this point. Oh, no. he was, There was trash talk after the fight more. You know what I mean? He, he, there wasn't any trash talk before, but he kept saying that I didn't win. And he talked himself into a, another rematch down in Florida, which I also submitted him. And then he denied that one forever and finally got me into the UFC. And he, he, he got me beat when it counted, I guess. You know what I mean? I really didn't want to take that fight. They forced me to take it. I really, I'm like, I beat the guy twice. I don't want to fight him again. It's a tough fight. It's a boring fight. Cause he's not going to stand. You know what I mean? So I, yeah, I think I had a lack of motivation for that fight and it cost me dearly. Uh, so your first professional fight, was January 18th, 2001. It was Frank Shamrock's promotion, uh, Bushido. Oh, yeah. Yep. It's Joe Garcia. Garcia, yep. I think I won that one with a knee bar, if I remember correctly. Yeah. Where do your submissions come from at this point? Well, so I did judo as a kid, which we know doesn't have great submission, but it gives you a, a certain idea. Then one of my good friends before I came over here from South Africa was from Russia and he was a Sambo guy and we played around a bunch with that. And then um, when I got up here, like I said, uh, during uh, my first year, after my first year at college, during the summertime to stay in shape, I joined a jiu-jitsu gym and trained there. And uh, 
that's where most of them came from, man. Just years of training and, and then uh, jujitsu and so forth. You know, it was my submission stuff was basic, but I was pretty good at my basics. You know, so I think coupled with the wrestling, it just comes naturally. So Joe Garcia, when you first turned pro, did you know that this this was the moment that you were just going to be a lifer with this sport? You know, I not really, to be honest with you. Like. You know, I didn't know if I was a lifer. We just, uh, I mean, I, you know, people always used to ask me why I fought. And I, I just said, I don't know, really. You know what I mean? I never really had a, a reason. I just didn't want to get a regular job. And I could make, scrounge, scrounge enough enough money by and, and do little odd jobs on the side. And it was just a, it was a form of freedom for my life. You know what I mean? I could do what I wanted, train, and then uh, do odd jobs to make up for for, for the lack of income from the fight and so forth. And, and that, I just enjoyed doing that, you know, but uh, yeah, getting paid for that first fight was pretty awesome. I mean, we'd obviously got paid under the table, but, but not that amount. You know what I mean? We were, talk we were talking 150 bucks. We would get to travel and fight and everything. And we thought we were Kings, but uh, yeah, I mean, I've always liked it. I've always liked it. I just didn't know if it was possible to, to make a living with it because even the guys, in the UFC weren't making the huge money back then, you know, not like they are today by any means. What, what, what was your impression of Frank Shamrock there? Like as a promoter, was that the first time you met him? No, I, you know, what date was, what date was that fight? Do you guys remember? Yeah, it was January 18th, 2001. Yeah. I hadn't met him yet. That was the first time I'd met him. I'd know who he was. I mean, he treated me real well, but like I said, Josh Thompson was already training with those guys. And I think it was Josh that got me on that card. So if I remember correctly, and Josh had been hounding me to come down to uh, AKA and train, come down to California and train, got me on that card. Um, and then I think it was, uh, well, I think my, I, you guys know better than me. The next uh, fight, I think, was that uh, big tournament in Denver, in uh, Colorado Springs, if I remember correctly. Well, when Frank Shamrock is a promoter, Josh Thompson said that he, it took him a long time to get paid. On that fight, did you have issues with that? No, I got paid that day. I think Josh and I think Josh, you know, with his nickname the Punk and Shame, Frank Shamrock being, I think they they butted heads a lot. I mean, they, you know, the controversy they had, and I think Frank probably didn't just pay him from principle. <laughs> you know, you know what I mean. So I don't I don't know anything about that, but uh, yeah, no, I got paid on the night before I went back. Hmm. Okay. okay. Well, and your next fight was actually March 10, 2001. You didn't hit the tournament yet. Okay. Uh, your next fight's Gladiator Valley Pudo against uh, Danny Lancaster, who you knocked out. Yep, yep. And then that's you moved not, on. A month that's later. not really his real name. It's Lassen, Lassen, Lassinger, I think, is what his name was. I know they got it messed out. Oh, Darcy. I got Darcy. Yeah. Yeah. So. so so from there, you fight in the ultimate athlete, John Pack. He's, he's the promoter, and you fight Kyle Seals. Oh, yeah. That was, that, that, was, that, was, that was a fight I took on, like, four days' notice. Guy Mesker is like, hey, there's a fight that opened up. They need a guy. Do you want to take that fight? So, of course, I said yes, and we went up there. And it was, it was, that was a tough fight just because I was so out of shape, and being in Denver, it was really a rough a rough run, but as always, I was able to hang in there and sneak out a victory. Not the most exciting fight of my career, but got the win. Seals at this time was with a, very, a relatively unknown gym uh, known as uh, Jackson and Mac Jackson. Yeah. yeah, that's where I met Greg Jackson the first time, and we've we always uh, converse and laugh about that when I see him. So it was like Ryu Jitsu, Jackson's Ryu Jitsu. He always had like Ryu Jitsu, yeah different names up until that point. I mean, you're talking about a guy that was a video store clerk, decided to create his own MMA, you know, version of a mixed martial arts for fighting and never had a fight before, but man, he's got some of the best talent in the world right now sitting at his yeah. gym. Yep. Mexico, October 26, 2002, oh, Cage man. fighting Monterey. Was Boy, this you're, Master you're bringing Vic? up all the old dirt now. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, Trevor, when you fought for Master Vic, was there any throwing of bottles of beer into the cage during or after your fight? Uh, you know, no. It was at the end, though, when I uh, 
I had one. My last match was against a Mexican kid, and when we, when that uh, one ended, yeah, there was a big row. But that was a, I mean, that was a tough fight. We uh, we both ended up in uh, the ambulance going to the hospital, which was an experience all of its own. It was a really weird deal, but. So you did an ambulance ride and a hospital gig in Mexico? Yeah, yeah. and they kept asking for my credit card, and I'm like, no, I don't think I want to give that to you guys. You know I mean? <laughs> it was a strange deal, buddy, but yeah, we were all cut up. It was a really tough last fight, and, and uh, it, yeah, it was all superficial, but they wanted to do x-rays and all kinds of shit, and I'm like, you know what? I'm getting the fuck out of here, so, you know, eventually Bob Cook showed up, and uh, we got the hell out of there. Okay, just just to kind of set the table. Brett Schaefer was was Trevor's first opponent. I know Schaefer yep. landed a lot of leg kicks in that fight, and uh, you didn't buckle. People on the internet were saying that man, this guy's tough as nails. Leg kick after leg kick didn't face him at all. Manny Valera, you knocked him out. That was your finals. Yeah. 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 So did you get hit with a bottle or anything like that at the end? No, I didn't get hit with anybody. I mean, it was a crazy show. There was a walk, like a catwalk walkway above the the cage. So there was people right above you drinking and stuff. It was a, it was a nuts little show. It really was. So but that was, that was what made it so cool. I would go back there and fight a show like that right now again, just because it was for the experience. You know, the experience was just crazy. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> so Travis View was uh we interviewed him a while ago and he talked about they flew him out of the wrong airport. They got him there from the taxi to the, the venue. They never paid him. The crowd was throwing shit at him. Yeah, it's those are crazy yeah. shows. That's weird because I got paid. <laughs> I don't know what the fuck. I ain't yeah. got paid on that one, I guess. Holy shit. So you yeah. roll into January twenty third, January twenty fifth, two thousand five, the XFA event against Chel Sonnen. You guys are the headline. The issue is you've got you and Sonnen, which are about an hour and a half apart, headlining in Florida with an entire card with only one local person. That's like two and thirteen on it. Like yeah. there's no way anybody was in attendance there. No, no, there was. There's a very small, small card and. Uh... I was already suspicious, you know. I mean, after that uh, that fight, so. But yeah, it was it was in a military hangar, I think, on the airfield, if I remember correctly. And uh, yeah, we fought there, but there couldn't have been much more than a few hundred people in attendance. So you fight Chelsea Sonnen again. You land an armbar, and you had mentioned you got paid that night, or when when did you get paid? I took that promoter, and he drove me to. To fucking uh, Fort Lauderdale, 40 minutes, got me a check from somebody. And, uh, yeah, I told him, I said, look, buddy, you're not going to fucking walk out of here if I don't get paid. And his wife got in between and started screaming and shouting. I'm like, listen, honey, I mean, it depends how much you love your husband, because if I don't get paid, this motherfucker is not walking out of here. I didn't come here. I did my job. I kept my part of the deal. You're going to pay me. So we jumped in a car. We drove, I believe, to... Uh, it was about a 45 minute drive. He got me a check. I think it might have been the top team guy that wrote me the check. Ian yeah, Lambert. Exactly. Yep. And uh, he drove me back to my hotel. I got paid. So yeah. we had I Dan Lambert on. I told him, I said, I'm going to fuck you. Either pay me or I'm fucking you up right now. That's the bottom line. There's no, I mean, I kept my side of the bargain. You're going to keep yours. You know what I mean? So we asked Dan Lambert about this because you, Dan has done so many random acts of kindness in the sport of mixed martial arts that they're kind of hard to keep track of. But yeah. you see a card close to his hometown, a couple of American top team guys on it that absolutely bombed. And Dan said, he had to think about it. He goes, yeah, yeah, I did. I don't even know the guy. I never met him. He called me begging for money, um, said somebody was going to kill me or something, and yeah, I gave him some cash. Yeah. <laughs> so you were that person. That's that good. he was that person. Uh, it, it, uh, it's fascinating. Okay. It's fascinating. You know, Dan. Dan looks at it from the perspective of, you know, Trevor performed. You know, the fighters. He's got a camaraderie and he's he's into it, so he makes sure the fighters get taken care of. If it, but what he really did is save the scummy promoter's life. <laughs> 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 Should have just let it play out. <laughs> well, 
yeah, we saved us both. I probably would have got some jail time. So <laughs> yeah, that's true. Uh, I, by that point, I was pretty freaking upset. You know what I mean? I don't, I don't like a man who can't keep his word. So, who, who's in your corner at this point? It was Trey Taligman came down with me, so I had him in my corner. So that poor bastard was really fucked. You know what I mean? Yeah, yeah. Trey, Trey isn't gonna shy away in that situation. Well, it's, it's, Trey, he's not gonna calm it down either. <laughs> no. no. No, he was sitting there. He was loving every minute when he had a big old smile on his face, he had a shit eating grin, waiting for everything to kick off. But hmm. it never That's did. We got paid. So you take a little bit of time off after that. And it was said that you went up to Colorado two weeks prior to the event in order to adjust to the the altitude. And that was September 6, 2003, the IFC $50,000 eight man tournament. Yeah, I went up. It's kind 10 of a controversial there. tournament as well. Why is that? Well, from what I understand, there was a little bit of mutiny in the locker room because it was like a fifty thousand dollar take all. And then, now wait a minute, what about our first fight, second fight, third fight? And there was some uh, arguing. No, no, there was. Uh, there was money progressive. I got paid for my first fight, so I got paid eighteen hundred bucks to fight Babalu. Were you up there two weeks early? I was up there 10 days early. Yep. We went 10 days. I stayed with, uh, it's kind of funny how things happened back in the day. So Eric Elber, Elber Raffin or whatever, the, who's promoting uh, Henry Sejudo and those guys now, they, I stayed at his house. It was uh, Mike Van Orsdale set us up there. And uh, yeah, he, he wasn't much of into anything about MMA yet. And we, we, he put us up for a couple of nights. And who's this? Uh, the promo, uh, it's, uh, man, he manages, uh, Henry. And then, no, er, well, maybe, maybe he's the coach, Eric Alberasson. Albert, the little dude always wears the white glasses. Okay. I don't know how to okay. say his last name. Yeah. I'm not okay. familiar. So. All right. So the AFC, let me just set the table on this a little bit. It's an eight man tournament. The participants, Babalu, Trevor Prangley, um, uh, Shogun, uh, Marisa Rua, Jeremy Horn, Arvedistan, Forrest Griffin, Tommy Sauer. Like, there's, it was kind of like a who's who in mixed it martial was, arts. Yeah. yeah, it was great. Do you remember the event almost getting canceled prior to the event? I don't. Okay, so from what I understand, the promoter took the cage from California, brand new cage, drove it up to Colorado. And the change of the climate warped the boards. So the commission was walking around saying that this cage really isn't fit for, for competition. And they did it, it, They were also spray painting it all the way up until the beginning of the fight. That's why you see like a lot of the blotches along the rail pads with like white spots on it because the paint was coming off on the fighters. Wow. Yeah, no, I, I mean, I remember them fiddling around the cage, but I didn't know it was that serious. Yeah, uh, Howard Petchler was a money guy. Paul Smith, how was Paul Smith as a promoter? Yep, he was great. Like I said, I've, you know, honestly, I haven't had an issue with any promoters. The biggest issue I had was the Florida one, and we got that sorted out. But I've never had a problem with any of the of the other guys. Maybe the word got out. I don't know, but but we never had a. I never had an issue with any promoter not wanting to pay me or treating me badly. They always, I always got exactly what they'd asked. Yeah, or said they were going to give me, you know. Did, did you There's wrestle in college with Jens Pulver? Horror stories. Did, did you wrestle in college with Jens Pulver? No, no. Did you Different know college. each other, was, hang out? No, he was down in Boise State. I was up north, about eight hours away. Okay. Boise State Division One. I. I was in a, a, a junior college. All right. Um, obviously, Babalu ends up winning the tournament. You, you. Uh, Win one round, lose two rounds. He advances, beats Jeremy Horn in the finals. Um, you have a state busy fight against Shane Schwarzer at the Kickdown Classic, knocked him out yeah. quick. And you move right into March 13, 2004, to the Euphoria show against Andre Semenov. Miguel, how does Trevor Prangley come on your radar at this point? Um, well, Euphoria was uh, was Vlad Lavrinovich as, as promoter, and you know, we were we we were able to up our little our level from like the hook and shoot where we maybe had 
a couple of imported fighters and a lot of local fighters where we were able to put together kind of international cards. If I, if I remember correctly, this one, the theme was, you know, Vlad had a team of Russians and it yep. was the Red Devil team. And I had to put together a team of Americans. And, you know, I've got a, a little bit more budget and stuff. But as a matchmaker, you know, I don't know. America may, versus Russia still, to me, it, it, it brings up some emotion. You know, I was not going to put together a weak American team. And as a matter of fact, if I could sneak a tough South African on there, I was going to do it. But, but that's the thing is, is I knew the Russians were coming – well prepared and also that they were going to be tough and that this was big for them, you know, so that they were going to take it seriously. And I had up the level. So if you look at the entire card and Trevor's fight was probably co-main or right around there, um, top to bottom, the American team is pretty good too. Yeah. So Andrei Semenov, he's 25, four and two, an absolute stud coming out of their country you got two heavy hitters, both with good chins. Like, it's got Fight of the Night written all over it. Why don't you take us through it? Well, you know, after the first couple of shots, I don't remember too much of it, but it was, a, you know, a tough fight. Andre's tougher than shit. He hits a lot harder than he looks like he hits, you know. So um, it, it was a shock. You know, I'd, uh, I'd fought Babalu, but Seminoff was a way tougher fight for me. Also, that was the first... Uh, fight I made 185 at. So when I fought Babalu, okay. that was at 205. So I dropped to 185. The cut was kind of hard. So I was, uh, yeah, but I mean, it was a good fight, exciting fight. It was, a, uh, I mean, if you see, I watched both my fights with Semenov, there's, there's no lack of action and there's no waiting for him to bring the fight. That guy comes to fight, you know? So yeah. it, it always makes for a good fight when you got a game opponent. Miguel, was Amarki Ambarian supposed to be the original opponent for uh, Trevor? I, I, you know, there may have been some shuffling around there. Was Armand on that card? Who did Armand fight? Yeah, I think he pulled out. Okay, it could be. The, the, the thing about it, look, as as you, as Trevor mentioned, Seminole, and you mentioned going over his resume, Seminole was a truck. Oh. So, you know, uh, you're on. A, you're working on a limited. If you really want to beat him or test him, you work out a limited list of people. And I, I picked right. You know, I'm not trying to toot my own horn, but I think Trevor was a guy that, you know, at the end of the day, he gave Babalu a good fight, but he lost. And this was one. This was a meaningful fight in that he was gonna. He was breaking through at the international level, and I was at lucky enough to be there for it. You know. Yeah, yeah th this was one of those fights. You know, because I think. I believe Semenov had already been in the UFC, and this was one of those fights that really made me realize that, hey, you know, I could make a career out of this. So thanks, Miguel. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you, man. Yeah, I, remember, I remember watching you in the, uh, in the sauna. You had a unique way of, cut, way, way of cutting weight, and it was with credit cards. Yeah. I never just saw scrape, that before. Yeah, I just scraped the... Whether or not it works, I don't know, but it always got me to wait. So, what, 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 is, what is it you do? You just scrape the sweat with the card. You just scrape your skin all over. You know what I mean? And it seems like it clears the pores real well, and you you keep sweating. It's, the sweat replaces what you wipe off. So, oh wow! <laughs> so what the theory really is? For me. Yeah, what the theory is is your body is sweating to cool your body down, and if you take that water off of you your body will yep. continue to replenish it in order to get done. And you cut like six or seven pounds in less than an hour that way. Like it was like an, I don't know about the time exactly, but it was very yeah. fast. It was fast. It was hard though. You know what I mean? It was, uh, I hadn't cut weight. Even when I wrestled in college, I didn't cut a whole bunch of weight. So that was my first like really big weight cut. And uh, <laughs> it was hard, but I felt good, you know, cutting it quick like that being able to get it get rid of it that fast and get it back on after the weigh-ins so you you would spend your career at, at middleweight what, what would you what do you walk around at like to cut down to 185 like without a fight plan 220 when, when i was uh when i was training yeah okay yeah yeah i, was, I never really got over 207 okay. I never got up to 210 so you know i wasn't a huge i mean big heavy metal weight but you know i wasn't as heavy as a lot of people thought i was I didn't cut as much weight as some guys do, 
But uh, yeah, that was my training weight was about two, between two five and two ten. Okay. If I was two ten, I was a little bit out of shape. So, okay. you think if you had cut weight in uh, Africa, you would have made the Olympic team? You know, probably not. I was pretty skinny and lean back then, and even like my first year in college, I, I just grew fast in college. My first year in college, I wrestled one hundred and seventy seven pounds, and I I never cut weight for it. Wow. So it's just like my my second year I wrestled 184 because they had that uh, weight change because those wrestlers died from cutting weight so they they made the weight heavier which whatever and uh, yeah that was also easy for me to wait and then when I went to Missouri Valley after that I started to get up to that 200 205 pound and I really had a hard time getting back down to wrestling weight I don't know what switched to my body or not but yeah my first two years in wrestling I, I barely cut weight maybe two three pounds before weigh-ins is all. Did you um, did you hang out with the Russian Red Devils after this event? Yeah, yeah, we did. Yeah, we had a we had a party. I, I remember Miguel will remember trying to calling me a taxi because we missed the bus to the airport. We were so smashed, yeah. you know. So I hung, <laughs> I hung out with Semenov and I had a blast. I mean, he just kept feeding us vodka, and the the promote I think it was the Russian promoter came in, and I mean it's just. That'd be the first time the Russians got me. You know about the second time, but yeah, they uh, we we had a blast and uh, we missed our shuttle. We came to Miguel. Miguel got us a car and we got to the airport and made it home. So, well, shortly around this time, you actually switched to training with AKA. Correct. I think it was in March of two thousand four, actually. Yeah, right I think after it was. Fight. Yeah, well, I actually trained at AKA for this fight a little bit. Was the first time I wasn't actually officially a team member, but I went down uh, and stayed with Josh for a couple of weeks and trained for this fight. And uh, Bob Cook actually cornered me for this fight. It was the first time he had cornered me. So, okay, no, no, not this one. I'm talking about the the I, the that was the tournament that Bob was the first. So no, I was with AKA already on this one. Okay, it was prior to this. I was okay. out, and you know, when I say I was with AKA, I, people got to understand I never made the move to California. I still lived in Coeur d'Alene and just trained down there for my fights for three or four weeks before the fight. So, what, did what made you stay? Career. What made you stay in Coeur d'Alene rather than moving full time to, to California? You know, I just I don't know, man. If you ever come to Coeur d'Alene, you'll understand. I had my wife there and. Uh, you know, we had a life there and I just didn't want to uproot it all. You know, if I look back now, I think if I had done that and trained uh, full time, I would have been the UFC champion. But I, di I didn't do that. I uh, I stayed in Coeur d'Alene and basically trained myself the whole time while I was up there. And then uh, when I come down to AKA for three or four weeks before the fight, sometimes five weeks, if it was a big fight, I would get uh, great coaching and great work there. You know what I mean? But uh all the other time, I was just uh, training myself. I'd, I'd wrestle at the college, and there was the jiu-jitsu gym I'd work out with and so forth, but I never really had a coach up there. What was it like training with Phil Baroni? <laughs> it's interesting. I mean, uh, Phil and me were pretty good buddies, man. I, I like Phil, you know, and uh, it, it's just, uh, yeah, the training, I did my own training. Let's put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> did you ever socialize with him oh yeah yeah i, st I stayed at um when he fought uh, frank shamrock i went down and stayed at his house for two weeks in vegas yeah he's an interesting character man i love phil it's never a dull moment you know what i mean you don't know what you're gonna get from one minute to the next but yeah he's living in uh puerto vallarta right now and uh his that updates is, i was wondering i haven't heard yeah. from phil in years it's interesting like you said, you know, it's it's interesting with a long pause afterward. You know, <laughs> yeah, you know, it's it's hard to talk about. You know, <laughs> you know what I mean. <laughs> so, yeah, I still consider him a friend of mine. So I don't want to discuss the whole thing. So. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> I, I I will not not to do a commercial for Idaho or anything like that. But I think part of the lore for Trevor too is Trevor's an outdoors guy kind of thing, and Coeur d'Alene is like. A little town on a lake surrounded by mountains. It's picturesque, you know? So I think yeah. I think that feeling of coming home and peace between the fights and the craziness, I, that may help, you know? Is that is that a part of it? Because 
it's definitely a part of it. You know, it's uh, I think it stems back from South Africa. You know, a violent country, a lot of crime. You, I mean, you locked everything, w w no matter what you did. You know what I mean? And then I got to Coeur d'Alene, and and nobody locked their doors, nobody locked their cars. People left stuff on their porches, and I just was like, wow. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. the, this shit would be gone in South Africa in one night. The town would have got cleared out, and uh, I think I got really <laughs> used to. I think I got used to that kind of life. You know what I mean? And then yeah. when I went down to California, it was big city again, like Cape Town, where I came from. A lot of people, and I think it just brought back that anxiety of, uh, you know, what's around the next corner. Because when you live in a country like South Africa, you really have to watch around what's going on. You know, you have to be really aware of what's going on. And uh, living in Coeur d'Alene for those years just uh, settled me down a lot compared to what I was when I, when I first came to the country. Isn't it wild when you run into places like that where you don't even realize you're carrying that type of stress until yeah. you realize you don't have to have it? Yeah, it took me about two years, I think. I think about it, I talked to my wife. It took me about two years to to settle down and lose that uh, that that like like hair trigger aggression, you know me, because you're your aggression is your best part of defense. You know what I mean? You can't show any any chill or nothing because people take advantage of that and so forth. So it took me a while to settle down. I think when I got into that groove, I just didn't want to give it up and move to a big city. So, yeah, I think that is a big part of it. You, for, for those at home, Michael Bisping has a story about being in South Africa where he tells a story about attempting to give somebody on the street a dollar and it being the worst mistake of his life. It's oh, yeah. it's that intense there. Yeah. I'm surprised he didn't get robbed. <laughs> you know uh, he I mean? did. <laughs> that, that's his story. Oh. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. But that's how it is, man. It's it's sad because you try to help people, but they use the kids to 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 uh to suck you in, you know what I mean? To isolate you, you as a victim. It's it's a rough place. It's a rough town. In 2004, you also hurt your hand training in a pull out of a fight with Sport Fight, the Matt Linland event. I think you broke yep. your hand training. Was that right around this time? You know, I don't remember, to be honest with you. Okay. Okay. I, I, know, I, I know I had a break, a broken hand at one point in my career. I just don't remember the exact time. I think it was, if I had to pinpoint. So June 19, 2004, UFC 48, you finally get the call up to fight the, up to the UFC. I believe it was a la you took a last minute replacement fight in order to get it. Yeah, I was, I was actually paint. I had a guy who uh, helped me, who, who was helping me, and I was uh, working for him, painting and uh, working. And uh, yeah, I was painting a house when I got the call. So I think it was twelve days, twelve days notice, if I remember correctly. And I was twenty seven pounds overweight. So no way. Yeah. Yeah. So we made uh, 27 pounds in 12 days, and uh, it was a rough walk after that scale. I'm telling you, the credit card didn't help very much in the sauna that day. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, we made the weight. We got the fight, and we, and we got in there and got the win. You know. So yeah, you won by neck crank. So, uh, Curtis that was seven three one. Curtis is actually one of those unsung heroes. Absolutely a tough guy. Another Midwest Super person. Tough. Yeah. yeah. Super, super good striker, you know what I mean? Did, did did Curtis I think Curtis also had the uh honor of fighting Seminoff too? You know, possibly. I don't know. Possibly. Yeah, I think I did that to him. <laughs> 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 so you were also supposed to be on UFC fifty. Your original opponent was Phil Baroni. It got changed to Ivan Salivary, and then you never fought. Yeah. What what took place there? I think I sustained a knee injury. If I remember correctly, I was a John Fitch knee about 10 days out from the fight. We were sparring and he, hit, he kneed me in the rib and sprung one of my ribs. So, wow. How was John Fitch in the practice room? Awesome. Awesome. He was actually one of my main training partners down at AKA. Great guy. I love John Fitch. Uh, great training partner. You know, everything. So the, the, inj the injury was a total accident, you know, so. It, wa it wasn't like uh, you got to be careful when you train with John Fitch. Just a, just an awesome human being. He used He's to call like, him Captain A.K.A. Yeah. Yeah. I yeah, was going to say, great, I was gonna say, he's like a training partner slash coach. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, he's just a, just a good – yeah, I really – I have a lot of time for Fitch. He's, he's a great guy. 
Yeah, we've had him on a couple times. His first interview is bonkers. When he first started, in his first four fights, two of the times, he got stretchered from the ring. Really? Yeah, we thought he was wasting his time. Like, all of us here in the Midwest knew he was a hard worker and a good wrestler. We literally got, man, this guy's wasting his time. He needs to go get a job. And then he rattles off, like, 23 wins in a row. Yeah. yeah no, he's... just uh, determination uh, just... winner, you know what I mean? Every fight was win with one with sheer hard work and determination. Yeah, no, no. He, he definitely – Went a long way. He got. He did get knocked out twice in, in the Indiana circuit with us. And uh, I mean, you know, with with a lack of respect, we used to call him the Twitch, John, the, the, the Twitch Fitch. You know? <laughs> yeah, we, we really <laughs> here so in the Midwest. Uh, you get wrong, yeah, you know. I'm glad he made me wrong. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, here he in the Midwest, on, he, he didn't think he was going to go anywhere. Like we really did. No. And he moved out to to California, and man, he became a legend. Yeah, and I went on to have a phenomenal career. Um, you returned to South Africa, kind of a homecoming trip, February 26, 2005, against Rico Hatting. Yep. That's a hard one. Yeah. Yeah, I know that was a rough one. So, uh, fought at heavyweight, you know, dominated the fight, but uh, just got caught. I, I God, I don't think there was even a minute left. I was so exhausted. I mean, one thing I can tell you is if you haven't seen your family in like five or six years, you don't want to go home and then have a fight two weeks later. You got to go home, have the fight the next day. <laughs> and then said, so because we just, uh, it was good to see everybody, you know, training and the fight wasn't even on my mind, but uh, tough guy, good jujitsu. He still has a gym over there. I stay in touch with him. Super nice guy, but uh, just caught me in a, like a leg scissor from the inverted leg scissor. And I just, yeah. yeah. I think anybody you... saw that coming. No, I sure shit didn't. But what do you do? You know what I mean? That one cost me the my next fight in the UFC. They actually cut me after that. So. Oh, man. Yeah, yeah his biggest win, for sure, his biggest win. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Okay. For sure. Well, you rebound real quick, March 26th, about a month later. Um, in sport fight, you fight an 11 and 2 Matt Horwich. Yep. Also, very, very tough. Tough, tough and durable. Yeah. Yeah. It takes a beat. He's, he's a little weird. Did he smell? Yeah, a little bit. You okay. know, a little weird. <laughs> Matt's a little weird. You know what I mean? He's definitely out there a little bit, but uh, super nice kid. But yeah, tough, man. Just tough and strong and, and, and just awkward as hell. What was your experience being managed by Ken Pavia? You know, I had a great management experience with Pavia. I actually still t- stay in touch with Pavia every now and then, you know what I mean? And he would call me, got a lot of, got me a lot of the fights in Russia and so forth, you know? So I didn't, uh, I mean, honestly, I, I enjoyed my time with Ken. No, Ken, Ken you know, probably, little... Ken probably had a list of, these are the fighters I, I maybe can get away with wronging them. These are the fighters I don't even want to try it with. And then he yeah, you know, I, I never even got the feeling that he was going to roll. I didn't hear of any him rolling anybody else, but I stayed out of all that shit. You know what I mean? I was in my little town in Idaho. I came and fought and went home, and I didn't get involved in any, any of the, the fucking hearsay or any of that. You know what I mean? My job was to fight, not to, not to gossip. So I didn't really <laughs> care. But, yeah, he never, he never did me dirty ever. So... That's good. That's good to hear. He, yeah. uh, you could share Joe Riggs' story. Joe Riggs said he, he was talking to Scott Coker, and Coker said, you know, you're one of the few guys we ever gave a signing bonus to, and Joe never saw a signing bonus. <laughs> oh, no. Are you kidding me? Are so, you kidding me? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Riggs, uh, it's about three and a half hours, our interview with Riggs. It was more of like a therapy session. <laughs> where he was just ranting and raving. Good guy, but yeah, yeah. Um, you fight it they, here. The UFC is a strange way of trying to get even, at least Joe Silva. I shouldn't say UFC, Joe Silva. Yeah. And they cut you for the loss, obviously, in, in, in Africa. And they make you fight a former training partner in Travis Luter, August 20th, 2005. 
Yep. Yep. It was I kind of to punish to... both you and Travis. Possibly, you know what I mean? But, you know, it, it, it is what it is. It's uh, it's never been personal to me. So, you know, Travis was willing to take that fight and he, he accepted he, They contacted him first and he accepted it. So, and uh, yeah, you know what I mean? It's not like I dislike Travis. I actually like him. I think he's a good guy, but it, it was a it was a fight, and I had to do what I had to do. You know. Yeah, great coach. Did you have yeah. any trepidation going into that because you guys had practiced together? Nope, nope. I knew he thought he could uh, submit me, but I, I, you know, I just felt confident there was going to be no way he was going to be able to do that, and and that turned out to be the case. When you look, when you Google search top 10 worst low blows in UFC history, yours comes in, yours comes in number seven. Yeah, it was a rare punching low blow. It was like an uppercut right to the middle of the legs. It was super embarrassing. (laughs) Shit happened in the moment, man. You know what I mean? (laughs) Well, he responded with one of his own. Like uh, it was that fight was about to get out of control before the referee took over. Yeah, no, I'm glad they stopped it. You know, what I mean, it, it is what it is. Nobody does it. Well, somebody maybe does it intentionally, but it definitely wasn't intentional on my part. You know, normally when normally when you low blow somebody, it's not when you're winning. <laughs> you know, so yeah, but yeah, no, the fight continued. I don't think it had any uh, difference, any effect on the outcome of the fight by any means. Yeah, Luter's a savage, man. He's uh he's an incredible teacher. Very good coach, very good instructor, and good jiu-jitsu guy. I mean, it's just I, I think sometimes jiu-jitsu guys forget the difference between jiu-jitsu. I think you're muted. There we go. You're back. I'm back. They forget the difference between jiu-jitsu and mixed martial arts, is what you were said, correct? Yeah, there's a difference. You know, it's not you may be a black belt in jiu-jitsu, but you you can get away with a lot in grappling that you can't in uh, mixed martial arts, you know what I mean? And I think maybe he forgot that, you know, you, you you go straight to trying to submit somebody, you might get punched in the face, so. All right. So you're 11 and 2 at this time. You're obviously riding a you know, pretty big wave. And November 19, 2004, UFC 56, they threw you in against Jeremy Horn, who's 85, 14, and 2. Yeah. His first time at 185, and he still looks the same as if he were 205. Mm-hmm. Like there's yeah. no body change on his end. No. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, what did, what did you know about Jeremy going into this one? Because, I mean, he, he was already, you know, an underground legend kind of thing. Did, what yeah. was his rep on your end? What did you hear? You know what? It's just, uh, I mean, I'd heard he, he, he's very experienced super tough i'd no need uh submitted chuck liddell in the past so you know it was a lot of uh focus on on grappling and and defense and so forth but uh you know just like i always said man i'm not going to turn down a fight you know that was uh unofficially a doorway to fight rich franklin had i won that because it would have been three in a row and if you remember back in the day that that could get you a title fight you know what i mean so there was a lot riding on that fight and i figured it was worth the risk and I still feel to this day I won that fight you know so I don't know uh, Eddie Bravo scored two to one as well on your side I scored it that exact same way yeah Eddie Bravo has actually scored it against me no really I just watched it oh okay yeah no I mean even Jeremy was if you listen to his speech at the end was like yeah sometimes things happen but you know it's 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 never I, I have no hard feelings. It's never the fighter's fault if the judges see it some some different way. You know what I mean? So Jeremy would take the high road like that, and he'd been there so many times where it's just an honest statement from him with a lot of experience. Yeah. Sometimes it happens. Yeah, it happens, man. It just uh, sucked that it happened on that fight. You know what I mean? There was a lot riding on that fight for me. So yeah. well, What was it, the conversation happened. with the UFC like in regards to that? Because everyone had thought you'd been robbed. Yeah, no, they didn't say a thing, man. Didn't say a thing. You know, like I said, uh, I wasn't a favorite of... We talked about Joe Silva. I really wasn't a favorite of his. I know that I wasn't his choice to put in against Kurt to start on the first time. It was Sean Shelby that actually 
uh, contacted Cook and, and got me that got me in on that show. So I think Silva had a little thing against me. And I believe that's why he put me up against Chael Sonnen on that next fight and forced me to take that next match because I did not want to take that match, you know. So with, with, with Joe Silva, what gave you the impression that he wasn't a fan of yours? You know, I, I don't know, man. I just got the feeling on it, you know. And uh, and uh, I believe somebody had told Cook that he <laughs> didn't like the wrestlers, you know what I mean? He didn't want any more wrestlers in didn't really want me and it was Sean Shelby that had gone around his back to get me in on that first fight as that replacement. That's okay. the story. Whether or not it's true, I can't tell you. I'm just telling you what the story was. Yeah, we've uh, we've got about a dozen interviews with people going all in on Joe Silva. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, he did. He did. Travis Luter. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. No, I, 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 I know that's why he put me with Sonnen and, and we try to get out of that fight. You know, I said, I mean, where do they ever make you fight a guy you've already beat twice? Yeah. That's well, not well, a rubber match. That's nothing. No. And for people keeping score at home, if you please go and watch the Jeremy Horn fight. Uh, in the third round, uh, baseball star Jason Jambi is shown on screen. Miguel, this guy, allegedly, it looks like he did an entire rail of cocaine. And then they throw the, the the camera on him. His eyes are coming out of his head. He's all jerky and jittery. He's like hiding behind a drink. It's phenomenal. It's phenomenal. <laughs> I'll have to go back and watch that. <laughs> yeah, oh, it's great. The Giambi clip alone is fantastic. Um, the Sonin fight, you said, tell us the conversations that took place. It's on April 6, 2004, UFC Fight Night 4. How does this get sold like to the UFC? You know, Chael sold it to them that uh, I, he had only lost to me once and blah, blah, blah. And, you know, we kept telling him, no, we weren't. But, you know, no real record of that fight, per se. I didn't have the video footage then. Somebody posted on YouTube way later. But, uh, I mean, we Bob Cook tried to get us out of that fight. And they were like, you take this fight or, or he's done. You know what I mean? So, and I think that uh, Silva thought that Chael had the best chance to beat me being that Chael's a better wrestler than I was, you know what I mean? So that was, uh, that, that was how it was, you know? So we Chael had to take the fight. I was not motivated for it. I didn't want to do the fight, but I, I pretty much had to, you know, and, and looking back now, if people don't understand, I think newer fans that, you know, back then the UFC had like four shows a year. If you remember, if you lost two, you were done. You know, it was a lot harder to get in and a lot harder to stay in back then. There was 100 guys snapping a chance on only four or five shows a year to get on. You know, now they have that a month. So, yeah, it was it was a good to be in there and you try to hold on to that spot. And, uh, you know, I think, uh, like I said, I think Silva wanted me gone and he thought Chael had the best chance of beating me. Sony continued to grab the fence opposite of Steve Mazzagatti to prevent takedowns. Yeah. Do you remember that? I remember that. He did that in our other fights, too. So he's just a dirty bastard. You know what I mean? Like I said, I love him, but he's a dirty bastard when it comes to fighting. Chael's thing is if you can cheat to win, it's okay, you know? The thing with, with what I noticed with Sonnen, and this is kind of the fight that I reference in regards to it, Sonnen's always looking for an advantage. And whether it's inside the cage or outside the cage, He's always trying to move pieces, and it's much more than the person in front of him. To start the third round, when, when Mazzagatti is bringing you guys together, he goes, no, 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 no. Have him wipe the Vaseline from his eye. There's too much there. And when he had Mazzagatti do that and continue, it, it almost like his confidence rose. Like he was able to instruct the referee on what to do, which yeah. is what he did in your first fight that the referee didn't listen. Like, He's tapping, he's tapping, he's tapping. As he's yeah. rapid punching, he was able to kind of move the referee, and this was the first time he was able to do it that I could track. Yeah, but, but possibly. I, I don't remember the that part of it, to be honest with you, but yeah, yeah, just a, just a bad, I mean, just a bad deal. That fight was uh, one I wished I could uh, redo. You know what I mean? You don't, I, I don't feel like I should, I need a redo on a lot of the, the lo losses that I had, but that one I'd like to have back. So, Yeah, yeah. Um, you hook up with Miguel again, Bodog, on August 22nd, 2006. 
Team Alpha Male coach, uh, Casey Uscola, who is 13 and 8, but a very, very tough 13 and 8. Very tough, yeah. Casey's one of those guys that he's a lot like Seminoff. If you get in the cage with him, you, you're in a fight. You know what I mean? It's not going to be a super tactical match. It's going to be a throwdown brawl. And, uh, you know, uh, as much as uh, those seem like chaos, I, I think I thrive in those kind of fights. You know, I think I always did. So I was excited for the fight. You know, I was excited to get a, a chance to to uh, to come back. Did I not have a loss between the UFC and that fight? Sonnen. No, no, no that's all I got. I got Sonnen. Yeah. No, I was on a two-fight losing streak, and I'd actually uh, thought about uh, maybe hanging it up, and it was actually Josh Thompson and Baroni that – sat me down and said, Hey man, just hang in there. You know, you're better than you think you are. You'll be okay. And then Miguel called and I was like, ah, oh, fuck it. Let's do this fight. You know what I mean? It was, it was decent money. It was a chance to go to Costa Rica. So we jumped on it, you know, who was the second fight? Do you remember? Well, I'd lost to Jeremy Horn. Right. And then yeah. I, I lost. Oh, and then I lost yeah. To Horn and, and so on. Yeah. Yeah. Huh. Um, with Casey Uscola, obviously you go to Costa Rica. Um, that was, we were you down there for an entire week. They filmed like three shows. Yeah. Well, we, it was weird, right? Miguel, we, we came back and we just came, we had to come back and reshoot that because that was a last minute replacement. So Casey was already down there or, or was a last minute replacement fight. We flew in the day before the fight. We fought and then we came back a few weeks later to do all the shooting. Yeah, I, I remember I remember you and Casey, like Casey came in late, and I remember you guys kind of meeting and agreeing to do the fight the day before. I remember I don't remember the exact details, but I remember there yeah. being some weird stuff there. Yeah, but we did no shooting, no camera work before the fight. Oh, okay, that's what it was. And you had to come back yeah, to we, do it. We, we had to come back to do it all, remember? Okay, yeah, yeah. Which I was okay with. Yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Costa <laughs> Rica is a gorgeous country. Did you oh, get man, into that... any of the little impromptu training sessions with guys like Jorge Masvidal or the Avalon brothers? No, I didn't. I didn't get into any of that. Like I said, we came right before that that uh, fight, so we didn't really get a chance. When when we came back and did our filming, it was just uh, Casey and myself. You're fighting against A Train Anthony Ruiz. Uh, Anthony Ruiz from Dethrone Base Camp. He's fourteen and nine. Strike Force. They're coming. Uh, you know they got a, a, a big wave coming with them. Frank Shamrock's obviously involved in helping them become who they are. Um, what was your experience like fighting for Strike Force? I mean, I always uh, had a good experience. You know, I know Coker and uh, Javier Mendez were good friends from back in the day, so we always had a good experience. You know, and that I believe that. First one was in Fresno, correct? The first time I fought him. Yeah. 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 No, it was a good. It was a good experience with Strike Force. Yeah, Fresno's the kind of their their home base kind of thing. So. Yep. Yep. Tough fight. Though. Why... Ru Ruiz was tough. Yes. Yeah. Ruiz definitely was. Um, somebody I think he's kind of underappreciated. Always fought hard. Um, Boy, Strike Force, Boy. absolute gamer. You win by 442 with an arm bar. And it seems kind of like, you know, with your win, arm triangle win over Casey Uscola, it sounds like you're kind of bet your wheels are back on the track again. Yeah. Yep. Starting to feel like I'm gaining a little bit of traction there. Mio, why, why did you opt for a rematch in Vancouver on Bodog December 2nd, 2006 against Andrew Semenov? Yeah, why not? It was a good first fight. You know what I mean? Like I said, I didn't uh, shy away from it. They offered the fight, and I'm like, yeah, I'll take it, you know? Was I, I, felt like, I felt like I had improved a lot since the first time I fought him, you know? So I, I, di I didn't figure it would be a, as hard of a fight, which was probably my mistake, so. Miguel, was, Ar was Armar Suluev supposed to be his original opponent? No, I think we had... I... Go ahead, I, go ahead, I, I definitely was supposed to fight Suluev at one stage, and I think either one of those shows was a replacement. I think it was the Vancouver one. I think Semenov was the replacement. Okay. Maybe that's why. Yeah, that could be too. Yeah, because I was, I know for a fact, because I was training with Phil Baroni then, he was, we were all hanging out, and he'd fought Amar Suluev, and I was supposed to fight him. You know what I mean? Okay. So Suluev is, uh, he's a character that you can make a movie out of. 
Yeah. <laughs> you know, his, his ties with the Russian mafia, the way he died. Um, it's just, yeah, crazy, 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 crazy life story. Um, Andre Semenov, obviously, you guys meet again. You win by decision at this point. Andre is 28-7-2. Uh, and two. I, It seemed like you were more dialed in this one than you were the first fight. Yeah, for sure. You know what I mean? I mean, if you think about my first fight with him, he was my, only my second top-level guy. The first was Babalu. And, uh, I mean, up until that point, I'd fought like, uh, you know, even Chael, who was tough, was a straight wrestler, more or less wrestler striker when I fought him and stuff like that. I hadn't, like, uh, Semenov was my first well-rounded martial artist that I fought. And so, and so, yeah, the second fight, I felt like I did a little bit better. Wasn't it quite as hard and as exhausting as that first one? Weren't you supposed to fight Matt Linland at some point in Bodog as well? I was. I don't know what happened with that, to be honest with you. There you go. Uh, I, think, I think that fight was scheduled after the condo fight, or we talked about it after the condo fight. At the condo, you guys were talking about uh, – oh, my gosh, he's still fighting. What's his name? Really Bobby Lawler? Guy. No. Uh, French, is he French, I think? Uh, he's French-Armenian or some shit like that. Okay. Fuck. Whatever. He fought in the UFC. Now he's back in one or, or some. Gosh, damn it. <laughs> It'll come to me. The, the, little, the little thing comes about the following way. Matt, to be honest with you, Matt had a two fight deal and his first fight was Fedor. And That's Matt, right. Matt wanted to finish his contract. Obviously, it was a very handsome contract. He obviously took a pay cut after the Fedor loss, but it was still probably his best payday. So Matt was somebody who had to, you know, was pushing to get his second fight in. And Trevor was in the title picture. So you got I got to get five rounds out of Lynn Lind. I got to, you know, if we're going to pay that amount, you, you can't fight a prelim or, or something like that. So I, I was building up, figuring Trevor would get the belt at some point. Um and then maybe make them fight for the title. And I think we actually did a little, you know, shenanigans at a press conference where you were talking about fighting somebody and, and uh, you know, you were on the podium actually talking about the fight and little in the audience kind of gave us a hard time saying he was there, he wanted the belt and stuff like that. Um, so, yeah, Matt was playing his part, coming from heavyweight back to middleweight to take the belt is what he wanted to do. Correct, yeah. I do remember that, yep. You were supposed to fight Robbie Lawler in Hawaii at some point where he pulled off like during the event. Yeah, what happened there? I don't know. I know we went over there. <laughs> <laughs> I think once the fight got canceled, I didn't pull out of that fight. I don't know what happened with that. You get like the flu during the event or something like that where it was with Icon. Um that's I, I can't imagine going through that as a promoter. Pa uh, Patrick Fritas, uh, Fritas was his name. That was a promoter. Yeah, yeah, no, I don't. You know, I don't actually remember what happened there. I know I went to Hawaii for a minute. And, you know, <laughs> I think once the fight got canceled, I don't remember too much of it. So, you were supposed to fight Robbie Lawler a couple times. Another time on Strike Force, um, I think Benji Raddick got injured. And uh, they replaced it with Robbie. Do you know, how did you and Lawler just never end up meeting up? I don't know. I mean, I don't know, man. It's just, uh, that would have been a hell of a fight. You know what I mean? Robbie was tough. That would have been a great one to have on my record, win or lose. Would have just been a, a great way to test yourself. I mean, Robbie's just a legend. He really is. I mean, he's still going. It's unbelievable. So, I really yeah. enjoy watching. I don't, I don't buy a lot of UFC fights, but I, I like to watch his. And, uh, a couple, couple of guys I really like to watch, and he's one of them, you know what I mean? He's just he's a great competitor. With Bodog, on February 17, 2007, Miguel's got you firmly in his system. You fight Tsunami, Jim, 10-4-1, Pierre Guillet. Yep. Yeah, it was also a stiff fight. Miguel would always bring a... He, he wasn't... His lineup wasn't your traditional one, but he would find diamonds in the rough all of the time. Yeah. No, 
No, Pierre was tough. I've watched a couple of his fights, but I knew if I put the pressure on him, he had a habit of wilting, and and I think that's kind of what happened. You know what I mean? Hell of a striker, but uh, yeah, you know, I'd uh, I was on, like you said, I was on a wave. My confidence was high. I believed I could uh, stand and strike with most guys, and also grapple with just about everybody. You know, so. Mm -hmm. No, behind behind the scenes at this point, <laughs> with with Trevor, we we were talking about. Anderson Silva. I mean, I, that's how high I had him, you know, I, on my – he was my version of Anderson Silva. He's going to be our champion, et cetera, et cetera. And I thought he could hang with that. It might, you know, it's probably a tough fight like every everyone else. But, Everybody, but I, yeah. I thought I had I had the right guy who could grind him out. You'd have to grind that guy, I think. And who could yeah, take, absolutely. And who could take his – his punishment, you know, Forrest couldn't take his punishment. I thought Trevor might be able to get in there. Yeah, th yeah. Who knows? But we had those conversations. I well, mean, it would have been the same. It would have been the same game plan as Chael's first fight with him. You know what I mean? It just I would not wouldn't have got subbed at the end. You know yeah. what I mean? So yeah, yeah. And it was so when I was working with Bodog with Miguel, like behind the scenes, like on you know the administrative side. Essentially, it was we've got to create confusion to where people can argue in regards to where the top talent has. And he was like, here's my lineup. He's like, chill, uh, not chill. So he said, uh, who was it? Cain Velasquez fell into that category with you, Miguel. Um, you, know, you thought for sure he kind of blurred that line, Trevor Prangley and Eddie Alvarez. So those were your three picks, Miguel. You could count Masvidal in there. It's, it's, I'm, I'm thinking of the guys that we gave, you know, contracts that actually they've all come back and said, hey, it made a difference. You know, I think Trevor's one of those guys that well, once he got to Bodog, you know, he didn't make earth-changing money, but he got enough of a bump that it made a difference. And that, and that helps a, a lot. Yeah. Massive difference to my life. Yeah. Massive difference to my life. You know, he he has none of that money saved. Like it's it wasn't that exorbitant, is what I'm getting at. You know, it's not like he made so much that he still has some there, but it was enough that makes the difference at the moment. And you know, what I was paying for was the motivation. When guys felt that, you know, if you look at it, their, their performances after that all started to to become exceptional as well. So Trevor was one of those guys that I think the condo fight was probably his best pay. And look at, you know, he took a, a world-class Japanese guy and, and made mincemeat out of him. Yeah, yeah. No, for sure. Your title fight, July 14, 2007, Yuki Kondo, Trent, New Jersey. I think this is the second or third time I'd watch you fight live. Yuki Kondo. What a legend. Yeah. What a legend. And uh, really motivated me. Probably the best shape I ever was in my life, you know, and uh, – I, I really wanted that win. I wanted that uh, that belt. You know what I mean. I'd had some really tough fights for for Bodog. We'd, you know, it wasn't an easy path up there. And, and I thought I, I really believed that I was going to win that fight, and I did. Actually, a lot easier than I had initially felt. I felt it was going to be a five round grind. So I just didn't you? feel it was it was surprisingly easy that fight. To be honest with you. I, I don't know if Yuki was having an off night or if I was just uh, had s such a high belief in myself or whatever, but it was it was an easy fight. Way easier than Semenov, let's put it that way. I thought we were going to see some leg locks. I mean, he's king of Pancrase, which is an organization known for its leg submissions. I thought for sure that we were going to see a, a ground exchange that could have been legendary. Yeah. Yeah, I, just, I don't know, man. I just didn't let him get off i guess you know i don't know what happened to him in that fight but i'm happy it happened yeah, I, yeah. I, <laughs> I remember trevor coming up to me after that fight and telling me that at towards the end he was hitting him with body shots and that the squeal that yuki was making is what told him hey i got him <laughs> he was yeah. he was hurting he was hurting from the punches to the body yeah there was a lot of damage i mean he, he he didn't answer the bell, right? Is how that fight ended. Yeah. yeah. You know, to I me, was just a, I was a, able to do a lot of damage in a short amount of time in that in that fight. So, I mean, to make somebody from Japan quit in a different country, even their own country, that's uh, that's a tall task. 
Yeah, especially somebody who's a veteran like that. I mean, he yeah, went he was in there. Honor. A lot of honor and a lot of tough fights under his belt. Yeah, yeah, and, it was, and, it was a great and, and just some on condos and some pressure because they don't let just anybody leave Pancrase and fight in other organizations. You got to be vetted and approved. And, you know, he was one of their best guys, obviously. So, but this pressure to perform as well. So, Tr yeah. Trevor got the job done. Yep. Do you still have that? When belt? did you know uh, Bodog was coming to an end? You know, uh, after that fight, we didn't. We, we had some uh, plans for a uh, a title defense, and it just never. I just heard by the grapevine that it's probably over. You know, so I don't know. Who called exact... you? Uh, Bob Cook told me. I believe. Mm -hmm. I believe he told me. It's a long time ago, man. I don't remember the details. Like I said, my whole career, I never really got involved in all the the petty shit. You know what I mean? I was there to fight, do my job, and and go home and chill. But yeah, I, I know it ended that way for whatever reason, but it was, uh, I was told after that, which is, it kind of sucks. I would have liked to have at least defended that title one time before mm -hmm. it went down. Did yeah. you still have that belt? Do you have the belt? I do. Yep. I still do have that belt. It's a nice one. Yeah, it was a really nice one. <laughs> so, so Miguel, at this point, you left Bodog unceremoniously obviously um did, did you make phone calls to any of the fighters you know some of the guys that you felt a uh maybe that you were close to you know i probably made some phone calls trevor would have been on the list if i was doing it in an organized fashion but i was probably not really that organized about it um and i uh, kind of you know, became a little bit of a recluse after that for a little bit. So I imagine that there was a wave of attempting phone calls and just saying, you know, goodbye and hello to everybody. And if I miss Trevor, it's just because, you know, I was disorganized. Yeah, so. I, don't, I don't take it personal, buddy. You know, it's a, uh, I've been around a long time, even by that time, and I'd seen a lot of organizations come and go. So you, you ride that wave when it's there, and but you're always in the back of your mind, wonder how long it's going to last. You know yeah. what I mean? There was sure. a, a couple who had stayed. You know, you had King of the Cage and uh, and UFC. Uh, UFC and Strike Force. I don't even. Yeah, Strike Force was being there around a long time, but they were still fresh in the MMA, so we didn't even know. You know what I mean? It was hard to tell who was going to ride that wave longer than the others. So always in the back of my mind, like, hey, this is great. I'm going to live in the moment and enjoy what's happening now. But uh, it can be ex expected it might end at any time. You know what I mean? So mm -hmm. you got to be a realist in that sport when it was still developing the way it was. Yeah. Miguel, what about you? When did you know it was coming to a head? Well, you know, there was I, slowly but surely I, I was asked, you know, to bring along a couple of people that were going to be the fight office. And I selected the people that were in there. And the moment that you get told, hey, you know, someone who's not a fight person is going to be a member of the fight office. You, they're, they're starting to creep in. And I think that they just didn't really know how to manage the situation. And like Trevor said, it very much is a wave, you know, to pick up where we had left off after seven or eight years of building momentum from hook and shoot all the way through this, it wasn't going to be able to be something that somebody else could really do the same way I did. You know, it, it, it was also kind of very personal, the, the, selection of the fighters and things like that. So, you know, a lot of it was something where it's like, when I went, things were definitely going to change. And they, they, that they didn't last makes me feel like, you know, they probably, you know, may regret having gotten rid of me because I think I, it got smaller and then it went away. And I don't think that's exactly the way they like to do things over there. But say la vie. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Trevor, when you fought in India... They gave away a lot of tickets in order to try to build recognition of the sport. What was your experience like in that country? You know, not it, it was like I said. Most of the times, I've been treated well, and they they treated us as fighters pretty well. To be honest with you, I mean, the country itself is just a really poor, poor country. It was, it was it reminded me a lot of Africa, parts of Africa. You know what I mean? The poverty and so forth is pretty sad to see, but. Uh, as far as the promotion, it, it was good. I know they bust a lot of people in there. They had that stadium pretty packed out. But, uh, yeah, as the fighters, we got treated well. 
Um, and what, what about your dealings with uh, the uh, Mark Pavlich of the MFC? I mean, you say you didn't really get involved with anything. He, he tried to drag you into a, uh, uh, like a little guy's... public back and forth. That guy's a fucking prick, you know what I mean? Really, you know, you try to uh, contract the guy down. He got mad because I went and fought Keith Jardine because Keith Jardine. But, I mean, when you have a problem like he has with uh, whatever it is that he has, you know what I mean? You would think that would build credibility for your champion. But, you know, he wanted his belt back. I sent his fucking belt back. And I should have kept the motherfucker now that I think about it because it's a real nice belt. And, uh, you know, and you earned I mean, it. Talk- yeah, I earned it. I, I, be, I had a tough fight for him. I won that title. And, uh, you know, like I said, I went on and I can't live off one or two fights a year. I was making my living full time by fighting there. You know, he didn't have a fight for me. So I went and fought Keith Jardine and got paid on, on that one and uh, won that fight, which, like I said, should give credibility to his champion. But uh, I, I think the, the, the control and uh, so forth, you know, not being able to control one of the fighters was too much for him. Yo, I, didn't even, of- honestly, I didn't even talk to him after that. I seen what he said, and, and uh, he sent me an email, and I was like, you know what, fuck off. You can have your shitty little belt back and, you know what I mean, live your miserable little fucking porn star life. I don't know. The guy was just a creep. He may have been hanging out with Jason Giambi, too, from what I understand. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't, even, who, I don't even know who that is. The guy that was doing coke at your uh, Jeremy Horn fight. <laughs> oh, fuck. Yeah, he was. He does do a backstroke in a fucking bathtub full of that shit. <laughs> yeah, no, the guys, I don't know, man. It's just a, he, he, I'll tell you a story about that, right? So I didn't have any uh, cash with me, and we had to get licensed. So this is the kind of guy this guy is. 50 Canadian dollars to get your licensing up there, I think was what it was, right? And it was the middle of fucking winter, like mine is so far. And I'm like, dude, I don't have cash and there's no uh, ATM in this uh, casino. You know what I mean? Can you just pay for my stuff and take it out of my purse? Nope, nope, nope. I mean, he wanted me to walk two miles to the fucking mall to go get the cash out. It was Bobby Lashley who I I wrestled with at uh, college in... in, uh, Missouri Valley, who said, oh, don't worry, Trev, I'll pay for you. So Bobby Lashley paid my licensing that night because Pavlovich wouldn't pay the $50 and take it out of my purse. Wow. For a guy who's fighting for his fucking title. That, that's the kind of guy we're talking about. You know what I mean? Yeah, and it's not even like, like you know, on top of the purse. He said, take it out of my purse. So it's like, yeah, yeah. it doesn't make sense. Take it out. I gave you five fucking good rounds. You know what I mean? Take it out of my purse, you cheese ball. <laughs> yeah, that guy, yeah, you're right. I said I didn't have issues with anybody, but that guy I did. I, I, I even forget about that guy. That's how unimportant he is to me. In the gym, at, at AKA, obviously nowhere near your weight class, do you remember working out with Rich Crunkleton? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. They've said that he might be the best athlete in the gym at AKA, you know, in terms of hard workers. Yeah. He was, I mean, just crazy. The, the, the balance and the athleticism of that kid, and he doesn't look like it, you know what I mean? But, yeah. And he's also the mo- one of the most interesting people you'll ever meet. He's awesome. Yeah, we got him lined up next week. Yeah, we got Crump. Oh, uh, that's going to be great. You gotta send me the link to that one. Yeah, for sure, for sure. Hey, what what about still, guys? Still, still to this day, Rich Crocodile will look up some Afri- Afrikaans swear word phrases and, and 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 weird stuff and send it to me. Because <laughs> I speak because I speak Afrikaans, so he looks it up, finds it, tries to type it in. He's like, "Is that right?" Then he'll send it to me. I got one like three weeks ago. <laughs> Funny as shit, man. I get at least one or two a year. <laughs> Ask him about it. It's funny. Yeah. That is funny. That's funny. What What about guys like, you know, more traditional guys like DC, Cain Velasquez? Like, I think Cain and you were, were there around the same time. Yeah, what, what kind of short stories can you tell us there? No, I mean, I don't, you know, like I said, I was only there for short periods of time. I mean, DC and Cain, just two phenomenal athletes and wrestlers and the, 
You know, I literally think that if, if Kane uh, hadn't had the injuries he had had, he would have been the best heavyweight of all time by far. You know, just unbelievable. The guy is just, I mean, indescribable. So I was there quite a long time before he came in. And to watch him go from straight wrestler, you know, I would, I would train, I was training when he first got there. Then I went home for about four or five months, came back for a fight. And it just, in those short time, it evolved into a really good and, and, and tough mixed martial artist. Great hands. Just jiu-jitsu was good. Just a phenomenal, uh, I don't know how to put it, but just uh, it, it just came naturally to him. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And normally when you get a guy who has that natural ability, they don't work hard. But that guy had it all. He really did. AKA was known for injuries in regards to people preparing for fights. Were the training sessions that hard there? Was there any safety measures in place to kind of you know, get people ready for a fight so that wouldn't happen? Not really. You know, we, we, we fought. I mean, every training session was a fight. I know now I took my son down there about five years ago, and they've really revised the training the way it was because of that. But, you know, it's uh, we talk in the early 2000s, and everybody's still trying to work the sport out and work out the best way to train and stuff. And, I mean, I think it made some of the greatest athletes. But, yeah, there was a lot of injuries and so forth because of that, you know. But, uh, you know, AKA guys, they could go into deep water and they just didn't quit in there because, I mean, a, a general training session there is if you had a fight, you would uh, have a new guy every round for sparring and, you know, you would have uh, Kane and you would have Luke Rockhold and then you may have John Fitch or Josh Koscheck your third round and these guys are all fresh. If they didn't have a fight, they were just waiting on the slide to give you work. And I mean, it was just, it was, it was sheer torture. Did you ever work out with Marco Huas? No, no. None of those guys over there? They had a lot of respect. The Huas Bailey Tudo guys have actually gone out of their way to talk about your toughness online. I had figured it extended more past uh, past the uh, Babalu fight. I thought you guys had shared a training room before. No, no, we, I haven't trained with any of them. Hmm. Miguel? Let's let's talk about a uh, fun story here as we near the end. Trevor uh, Wally was a bow dog champion. Brought along a protege one time to Russia. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, this is a what was his name? Josh. Josh Curran. 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 Josh Curran. Yeah. Otherwise known as the Buffalo Head. <laughs> yeah. If you've seen him, you would know why. Yeah. His poor mother. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, so where'd you dig him up? Like, what's the story with Buffalo Head? Because, you know. Like, I, here, let's, let's, let's kind of set that table. Yeah, You're but, talking about a guy that's a relative unknown that's got a win over Roy Nelson. Yeah, yeah. not only a win. I'll tell you the story of that. I don't know if you remember, but uh, he was in jail. I had to pay his bail to get him out of jail so he could make that fight. So we came over to Russia. He hadn't trained. He was in jail for a week. I was wondering where the hell he was in the gym. And I uh, heard he's in jail. I had to go get him. We jumped on a plane, got to Russia. He fought Roy Nelson on barely any training and uh, beat him and then came back. And that was pretty much the last I saw of the Buffalo head. So just yeah. a, a, just a sad story, you know what I mean? I, I know he's, uh, I see his mom on and off. She uh, works at one of the casinos here where we have fights, and I see her. And uh, I mean, he's just, uh, I think, too much meth, and he just, he's, he's gone. Or she said he's pretty much insane now, you know, when he walks around and thinks he's a street prophet and, and just, he's homeless. So it's, it's a sad story, really. As, as entertaining as he was, there's just a sad way to end that story, you know what I mean? You talk about, somebody who was on the cusp of being great. I mean, what a great backstory, a tough fighter. If he got some good training, I think he could have gone real far in the heavyweight division, but just uh, couldn't pull it together. Pretty sad. So he beat Roy Nelson with no training? No training. I mean, he came in, he probably had five sparring sessions for that fight. That was it. Holy cow. Yeah, just a big old... uh, 
Why would you know. sign him up for that fight out of curiosity? Was it just to kind of make I sure did. he stayed in the gym? Yeah, you know, he needed the money and he wanted to fight. Like I said, I never said no to the fight. They offered him the fight. I said, you want to fight this guy? He's really good jiu-jitsu. Josh had wrestled at college, so he was a decent wrestler and he was a great striker. Just heavy hands and we figured that he could stop the takedown. You know what I mean? Which he didn't do in the, in the first round, but managed to pull it off in the rest of them and, and beat Roy with the striking, kind of like we'd planned, you know? Just a... Josh really had, he could have, with his backstory and stuff. You remember Miguel, he was living in a tent with his two kids on his buddy's lawn? Yeah, uh, remember was, that? yeah, yeah, of course. So, and that, that's why, too, when, he, when they said he needed the money, you know, he was fighting, he wasn't on the high end of the pay scale either, but it helped him no. out, and, and you could have bought him along. It's a shame that things fell apart. You know, Bodog was, wasn't able to bring him back either, you know. Maybe if Bodog had stayed, he'd be okay, you know. So it's a, yeah, it's a, a knows, weird, li weird life thing there, you know. Yeah, just it's, it is. It's one of those life things, you know what I mean. You just don't know where it's going to turn up, and he's just it didn't turn out great, you know. I, I, I do you remember the Chael and uh, Chael's interchange with uh, with Jeff Curran at the airport where Jeff was grumpy with him? Do you remember? Or you want me to tell it? Yeah, tell you tell it. <laughs> so Buffalo Head is drinking after after the fight in Russia, beating Roy Nelson, and everybody's going back to to the airport. And Sonnen was on the card, and Sonnen asks him, "How old are you?" <laughs> and Buffalo Head gets offended. He's mad. He's drunk. He's mad. He's like, "What do you want to know?" Uh, and Sonnen answers, <laughs> "Because you act eight years old, and you look like you're forty. <laughs> so I have no idea how old." <laughs> <laughs> this channel giving him a hard time so yeah the buffalo was rough, rough around the edges uh but yeah the buffalo when we got back to the airport that time he had lost his ticket and uh, i mean you could try to get a new ticket a new boarding pass in russia they were they asked about oh this is a big problem so i didn't know i mean we were fucking searching anywhere well that muppet had put it in his cap for safekeeping and he had taken his cap off right before we were supposed to board the plane and he's like, oh, my gosh. And there it is, sitting in the top of his fucking cap. <laughs> so we stressed for like three hours thinking we're going to be stuck in Russia. But, yeah, we found his boarding pass. And... He had it the whole time. He had it the whole time. That's yeah, that, that's Mr. Buffalo Head for you. Trevor Trevor was there as a babysitter. Trev, thank you so much for joining us. We appreciate your time absolute pioneer of the sport. We'll be sending you a link and uh, everything next week, okay? All right. Thanks, buddy. I appreciate it. Definitely good to see you again, brother. See you soon. You too, buddy. Take it easy, man. Well, Mike Davis, the Lights Out Podcast now has Trevor Prangley in the books, our first South African. Our, not only our first South African, I think we've got like 70 total downloads from that country so that one person that listens is going to be so happy. Yeah, we got the, the South African. Um, yeah, we, a little bit of nostalgia for your, that of yourself, though. Yeah, you know, I mean, he's exactly the same kind of guy. He's just a nice guy, the kind of guy who, you know, I we'd go out after the shows and he'd have my back kind of thing, you know, that kind of thing. But also, like, a guy that somehow sends out that vibe that you don't mess with. You know what I mean? It's like, I, I remember walking into one training session he had and he was practicing tying you up up top and foot sweep and pushing you down so that he'd have your leg here so he could foot stop you here and i'm like but trevor that you know you can't do that in a fight that's illegal he's like no no i'm just practicing it you know <laughs> he's practicing illegal moves just Smoothing them out in case, just in case, you know what I just mean? Just in case. So, yeah. so yeah, it's like you, you can't do that in a fight. I was like panicking, and he's like, he laughs, you know that laugh he has. Ha ha! No, no, no! Don't worry about it. So, uh, yeah, definitely uh, one of the toughest guys I've ever met. You know, you've always, you've always had a thing for him in terms of as a fighter and a, in a person. Um, yeah, we started working with each other like around 2003, I want to say, 2004. And you were you were always hot on Trevor Prangley, not only as a fighter, but as a person. And you can see why, like he's built differently. Like his head is big, his hands are big. 
And, you know, he's got the little accent well, to him. So, like I said, it was full medicals, you know what I mean? So it's like they had everything. The doctor came up to me and he showed me his, you know, his brain scan, his CAT scan. And he said he's never seen a skull that thick. And you could see, like, he's like, there's this whole extra, like, around here. So he, when he took a shot, always, you know, had that. He actually made reference to his super head somewhere in the interview, and we didn't touch on that detail. But, yeah, he's got a doctor's clearance on how thick his skull is. Yeah, Julio Cesar Chavez also has got, they said his skull is about twice as thick as the normal average, like, the bone density. Um and, and Trevor, he, uh, I think the one thing that held him back as a fighter was his hand speed. His toughness, his grit was always there. Hand speed was a little bit slow, but man, that guy, when he hit somebody, he like changed their life. Yeah, I, th I think he was older too. Like, I, I think he was at the point where if we had gotten him five years younger and he was, you know, yeah. The athleticism wasn't starting to fall off. Yeah, I, I agree with you. I think speed, he wasn't afraid to take a shot either, which, you know, he's still talking pretty good in the interview and, and you know, ex exchanging and lively and stuff. So that's always good to see, especially with a guy like that. You know what I mean? Absolutely. So definitely a walk down memory lane for me. And I, you know, I, I consider the guy a good friend. Yeah, no, clearly. And, you know, he's got a lot of respect for you. He's the type of guy that, He's the type of guy that can look around his house and just point at certain objects and go, oh, Miguel did that. Miguel did that. Mm -hmm. I mean, he, he made some money with you, which is always a good thing. I mean, you were always very pro fighter. You, you paid more than you should have. And, and you knew it. It wasn't like you paid more than you should have and you didn't know. You paid more than you should have and you did know. So, Miguel, Wes Sims gave me a list of people. Petey Wheatstraw, Hong Kong Fooey. Thank you. Appreciate you. I appreciate your guys' support. Um, MMA purist as well. Um, DeVry's Town on YouTube. Uh, always um, uh, was it Vegan Higgler also. You know, those guys are always making posts uh, for us, and it's sincerely appreciated. Greatly, greatly appreciated. Yeah, for sure. And uh, that's it, man. We got Trevor Prangley. In, in the, the books, book. dude. Yeah, we got another one. Check out the full interview on iTunes, Spotify, and all major podcast platforms.